So welcome uh, to Flip the Switch podcast by Power Digital. This is Grayson LaFriends, CEO and founder of Power Digital, and I'll be your host today. And today I am joined by Matthias Metternich, who is the co-founder and CEO of Art of Sport and a very accomplished and successful uh, entrepreneur. And so very excited to have him on the podcast today. And before we get into uh, his story and, and talk about a lot of things oriented around growth, which is the theme of this podcast, wanted to give a couple of quick hits that I thought were really interesting on Mateus. So first of all, he launched the personal uh, care brand Art of Sport at the end of 2018. And he had two pretty impressive partners and co-founders, one of which was Brian Lee, who was previously co-founder of LegalZoom, Honest Company, Shoe Dazzle, and many others. And then also the late, great Kobe Bryant, who all of us know, love, and respect. Uh, and that's a pretty cool story that we'll get into a little bit later. But Matthias also launched his first company at the age of 14. So he got into the entrepreneurship game pretty early, definitely earlier than I did, and uh, grew up all over the world. I think uh, lived in 11 plus different countries. So certainly uh, his upbringing in life uh, threw him out of his comfort zone consistently and created a lot of growth. And so we'll be excited to get into that. But Matthias, thank you very much for uh, joining today and excited to chat with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Hey, so kicking it off, obviously, it's uh, we're on week three of uh, 2021. How's the year kicking off for you all and kind of where are you guys in your planning and, and getting things going? Uh, we're, you know, we're, we're moving very quickly. So we've, we've, we, as you said, we started in 2018. Um, we started at the end of 2018. So I really clocked 2019 as our first full year in business. We were really ironing out a bunch of kinks at the beginning of 2000 or at the end of 2018. We launched um, online only. So we're a D2C business um, on artofsport.com. Uh, we also took the interesting approach of um, launching on Amazon uh, as well, which is um, runs somewhat counter to the kind of conventional wisdom in the D2C space, especially with um, Silicon Valley investors. Um, but we really felt like Amazon was a really um, compelling platform uh, to test out our thesis in a, in a sort of a public way, but also, you know, if it, if it did stick, uh, then you could sort of uh, experience some really uh, rapid traction and rapid growth through that, through that, through that channel. So we launched those two channels. So 2019 online only uh, in 2020 um, in February, we launched a target, which was a, a very, very large rollout um, of 1600 uh, uh, retail locations and 14 products. Um, it was the largest partnership they'd done in skincare. Um, and so we were very excited to take the brand omni-channel. It was always the, always the intention. It wasn't quite uh, clear at the beginning when we would do that. Uh, but 2020 was our first real kind of baptism by fire of launching it at brick and mortar. Um, and so far this year, what's exciting is that um, you know, we're, we're sort of coming into the end of January now, but um, a lot of resets are happening across the, uh, the retail landscape. Um, and we had secured or we, we secured in, in 2020 uh, significantly wider distribution through brick and mortar. And so um, almost on a daily basis, I'm getting uh, pictures sent to me of our products on shelf at new retailers. Um, yesterday, it was with CVS, who will be at about 7,000 locations this year. So uh, very, very excited about the year so far and, and really the beginning of, of, of seeing this brand become a household name through, through a, a number of new retail touch points. Yeah, that's amazing. Hey, one thing that sticks out that's interesting that you said is, you know, I actually think that I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think Amazon is a great place to launch a new brand or product because it gives you that kind of intrinsic uh, trust. Obviously, conversion rates are a lot higher and it's just a great way to kind of get that critical mass and start to get a great product in people's hands. But you mentioned that uh, Silicon Valley investors typically don't like that. Uh, I'm personally not as experienced with that and their view on that, but talk us through that. Why do you think that is? And what is the kind of view that they tend to have around Amazon as a jumping off point? Uh, yeah. So, so I think, um, it, you know, it's, it's easy to generalize. You know, the, 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 I think the theories have evolved a lot over the years. Um, and so, you know, if you go back 10 years or seven years, even, um, I think there was always, there was a bit much more entrenched philosophy about this idea that you're building a destination on, a, on your dot, dot com, that you're somehow going to reap these 
enormous rewards by having this direct relationship with consumers and you're going to leapfrog the brick and mortar uh, players and legacy brands um, and just really hammer the social media platforms to get your message out there. And that was fine, I think seven years ago where maybe it wasn't quite as saturated where the price, the cost of acquisition wasn't quite as high as it's become. Um, and also this idea, um, I think there wasn't really much of an understanding of how consumers or appreciation for how consumers shop. And so this idea that, you know, just because you might buy it at brick and mortar doesn't necessarily uh, exclude the dot com channel. You know, it's it, it, these aren't cannibalizing channels in many ways. Having that halo and having those multiple touch points lifts all tides or lifts all ships rather. Um, and so I think that's evolved. Um, Amazon is is one of those uh, odd ones where I think come the last five years, uh, you know, that's surfaced more and more within the consumer landscape. Um, as to what role it plays within that omni-channel spectrum. So, you know, if you have a, an online destination on your website, but you're also freely available on Amazon, um, what, what, what would, you know, I think the fears around cannibalization there are, are, are quite loud and, and even greater um, than, than necessarily brick and mortar versus dot com. And so I think what we're seeing is um, a, a slow and gradual appreciation of that channel uh, and, and a sort of an, uh, the feeling that Amazon isn't necessarily a holding all your data hostage. You do, you do get good data out of the platform, um, you know, an appreciation that your dot-com business can continue to thrive um, if, if you're on Amazon. And I think all it does is it underscores having good strategies in place and understanding why one channel is better than the other um, and how they play nice together. And so I think if you can table that with, with the right investors who have a, you know, an open mindset, I think those those investors in Silicon Valley are a little bit further ahead of the of the pack, um, and, and and more able to appreciate those channels. So it's a it's a pretty nuanced and, and big discussion point. But for us, we've we've had the benefit of having investors who who really I think get it and are willing to to try it and uh, test it and and then kind of go from there. And, and we've had we've had a lot of support around that uh, approach to to omnichannel. Yeah, and I couldn't agree more with your approach there. I think you know in this day and age with uh, consumer brands in particular, it's about really what is best for your customer. And sometimes that's going to be buying on Amazon. Other times that's going to be through the dot com. And I think you have to find ways to you know, make that worth their while because there is a little bit more effort. And sometimes yeah. it's in retail. And I want to dive a lot deeper into that. But before we get deeper onto that side, I think it would be great to hear a little bit more about kind of your upbringing and story. Yeah. Because to me, that's just incredibly interesting, and I think a huge part of how you've evolved into, uh, you know, where you are today. So, walk us through a little bit about kind of what your childhood and upbringing was like, and and uh, share some of those stories. I think I think it's super interesting. Yeah, cool. I uh, so my 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 dad was an ambassador. He worked in the foreign service in in Germany uh, post World War II. Is that what that means in real life, or uh, is what is that? Is that mean he's like a CIA uh, operative, or is uh, <laughs> ambassador a real thing? Uh, it's a real thing. It's it's a uh, it's uh, you know it basically is it's, it's the head of state um, abroad for a country. So you 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 know in America it's slightly different. You can you know through through having buddies in the White House, you can be randomly appointed to an ambassador role. In most other countries, it's a career path where you literally start at like the age of eighteen or twenty, go through the Foreign Service. And then work your way up in the political landscape to, to sort of uh, sort of fill that role. Um, and and it, the cool thing about the role is, not getting too much in the weeds, is um, you know you're especially in that era in the Cold War era. You know, you're, my 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 father was in a position where he was representing a lot of really uh, challenging interests uh, around the world, and and every two to three years would would get posted somewhere else. Um, and he would be involved in that decision to an extent, he'd sort of have a short list of places he could go. And then based on his, you know, interests and his, you know, view on how much of a role he could play in those places, he would elect to move to those places and the family would, would follow. Um, and so I didn't have a lot of say as a kid of where we'd end up, but, but it was always an adventure. And every two to three years, it would be sort of a, a another sort of case of where in the world do we want to move? Um, so, you know, I was born in Germany, moved to the Soviet Union. Um, had a bunch of, uh, as far as I understand it from my folks, a, a KGB um, nannies who, who sort of looked after me, uh, moved from the Soviet Union and that sort of dreary 
scary kind of uh, Cold War frontier to Los Angeles. So it's a sort of a baptism by fire there. It was the first time as a kid I'd sort of taken in Chuck E. Cheese and the Dodgers. Um, and that was a, kind of mind blowing for a kid. Uh, and just as I was starting to acclimate to that, to that lifestyle, my parents moved us to Mongolia. Um, so lived in Mongolia for three years. I remember the first day looking out through the window, um, uh, sort of like, you know, <laughs> rubbing off the, the, the fog of the window and seeing a yak and a Mongol herdsman walking his uh, cart of firewood through the city and just thinking, you know, where, where the hell are we? Um, and, and, you know, there was transitions like that through my, throughout my life, Europe, Middle East, and so on. There were two constants in my life that, that, that really shaped, I think, who I am. In particular, one is maybe sad as it sounds, is, is was a computer um, and uh, sort of my best friend, the computer. Uh, but, but, you know, uh, I had that in my bedroom and I, I had a lot of time on my hands and was always kind of the, 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 the odd character in the room who was, you know, in and out of places. And, but in a computer, I could teach myself things. And I remember just inhaling everything I could and, and taught myself how to code because I started with video games. Um, I sort of played those to death and, and needed something new to do. So I sort of taught myself how to build my own video games over a period of time. Those got, you know, incrementally better. Uh, but one thing that I learned from from building things was like, you know, uh, the, the path of entrepreneurship is really it's really a question of you hedging, hedging failure and hedging risk and, and uncertainty. And if you don't have those and you have a safety net, which was, you know, my bedroom in my home with a hot meal that it would get, you know, made for me at the end of the day, you know, I could kind of go crazy um, and, and do whatever I wanted. And so it was an absolute, you know, absolute zero fear of, of making things. Um, and, and it wasn't necessarily for commercial gain to begin with. It was, it was primarily just uh, expression and learning. And I spent four or five years self-teaching, made a bunch of video games, then started my first couple of digital companies um, off the back of that. Um, but, but one thing that I really started to appreciate early on was, was that really interesting mix of tech and, and coding and developing things with creativity and expressing those things. And, and you, you know, when you put things in front of people, they, they might appreciate the functionality of something, but they might think it looks terrible and basically lose interest very quickly. And so just by virtue of sort of swimming in the medium of computers, you, you, you have to teach yourself the full end to end, which later in life revealed itself as very valuable because I could kind of think operationally and through finance and whatnot, but then also, you know, the smell test, the sniff test with consumers uh, does this look good? Does, is this fun? Is it compelling? Is it inspiring? Uh, was, was, was sort of, you know, the proof, the proof there in the pudding. So, um, so that was my, that was my upbringing as a kid. The, the other constant in my life was sport, which I played a lot of sports throughout my life. And um, I think with art of sport and, and, the, and, and what we're building here, those two things really collided for me, obviously with, with the, with the, with the involvement of my, of my co-founders, Brian and Kobe, um, and you know, it was a it was a very clear passion for me that I that I'm very excited to see prove out, and the hypothesis start to really prove out. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you want to get into a couple of other deeper questions there, but you know, was it? Yeah, it was, no, that's that's amazing. And you know, when I think about growth, uh, personal growth, you know, I've I've met entrepreneurs over the years, you being one of them, that you know have that kind of childhood story where they're. Fam, whether it's military family or whatever that is, and they're moving. And I think it teaches you a ton. I mean, I couldn't imagine, I grew up in this, in, in the elementary school and then middle school and kind of same group of friends that you evolve and grow with, but getting dropped into 11 different countries at that age, I can't think of many things that would put you out of your comfort zone more. And I think I remember you telling me that your dad or your parents would even kind of mess with you a little bit and uh, really <laughs> yeah. put you out of the comfort zone. Can you share one or two of uh, those examples? Yeah, uh, I mean, there are, there are a lot, there's a long list of them. I'll give you, I'll give you three. The first one was um, when we were in Mongolia, um, you know, I was going to an international school and, uh, and after about six months or seven months of finally making some buddies and friends and understanding how things worked, my, uh, my folks sort of said, hey, we're, we're sending you to a different school uh, tomorrow. Um, and it's a Russian school, it's an all Russian school. And uh, I said, I don't, you know, I don't speak Russian. Um, I said, you'll, you'll figure it out. It'll be fine. And, uh, and it was, it was a proper like Soviet era Russian school that Mongol kids were going to and zero English capabilities. And I have no idea what they were thinking. And so I arrived at the school and there was nothing for me. There was no way for me to communicate outside of hand gestures. And, um, 
And uh, I spent a lot of time doing math because it was kind of like there, there wasn't, you know, there's no language barrier there. But then I also started teaching the English class when so I was like you know, nine, nine years old, 10 years old. And so I was the only person pr proficient enough to sort of stand in front of a room and sort of point at a couple of words and help people with pronunciation. So that was one fun one. And it sort of manifested in education a lot. You know, about a year after that, my, my, my parents sat me down and said, okay, you're not, we're done with Mongolia now. Uh, we're sending you to a German boarding school in Germany. Um, and, uh, and, you know, they've graciously offered to not give you grades for the first year because you'll need that time to learn the language. Huh. Um, and, uh, and, and my father was like, and, and by the way, you're, you're you know, I'm very important that you learn Latin. And, uh, and so they put me into Latin classes and like learning Latin and German when you don't speak either is just a shit show. Um, so that was another example. And then the third, which was super cool, um, which was very, uh, which was reserved for the foreign service folks of the, I, I don't know how it is in other countries, but you know, German foreign service folks is they have this catalog they give you every year and in the catalog are probably about a thousand destinations around the world uh, for the kids of, of people working for the foreign service. Um, and you can, and you can it's, it's organized by the German military and it covers everything. It covers like riding, you know, horseback riding camps somewhere, hiking camps um, in, 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 in any part of the world. And it's a safe place. And you go with a bunch of other kids and you just literally say goodbye to your folks and you go for four weeks and it's paid for by the government, which is incredible. Um, and so every summer it was a case of my parents literally handing me this book and saying, all right, where, where are we going this year? Um, which was just a crazy privilege to, to have. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for that. I don't know how I'm going to emulate that for my kids one day. Um, but it was, it was, it was, that was sort of the tone in, in, in the household was, was just like, you know, this is, what are you doing at home? Um, you know, get out there. Um, and, and I don't know if that's a disinterest from my folks. Maybe they were just completely disinterested in raising me, which is fine. Uh, <laughs> no, but it worked, it, out. Did have, it worked out. Yeah. yeah. That's funny. That's yeah, it's wild. And it's, it's neat to see how those things shape somebody. And I think as an entrepreneur, it's all about you're constantly out of your comfort zone and pushing the limit. And so you were obviously uh, put in those positions at a young age and, and got comfortable with that. And I think probably has served you really well. And it's funny because I was reflecting on, you know, I always felt that my parents did that to me and they'd make me get up in front of church and speak when I was uncomfortable or we'd yep. be on a family yep. trip when I'm in middle school. And my dad would go up to some girls and tell them, hey, my son over there, you know, he's afraid to come talk to you uh, and stuff like that. And I remember I used to just cringe, <laughs> but I think it's a healthy... Uh, thing and and teaches you how to put yourself out there and be okay with you know rejection as it occurs and just roll with the punches um before yeah and i think to that and i think to that point you know i think it's it's not so much the 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 um you know in my case i had the for, good fortune of these really crazy and super varied experiences but i don't think that that is a prerequisite for forming that brain i think absolutely to your point i think if my father had had actually done that with girls, it would have probably blown my brain even more than, <laughs> you know, going, going somewhere oh, yeah. random. Um, so, so I think it's a, it's, it's a, it's a truism for, I think everybody in the world. And, you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways you can establish that. And, you know, we have a, we have a small boy here and, and, you know, part of my challenge is how, you know, at what rate do I do that? And he's only, you know, he's only just turned two years old, but, um, you know, I don't know about sticking him in a Russian school in Mongolia yet, but I'm, I'm thinking about ways that I can kind of, you know, push him into, into becoming his own man. Yeah. Build his confidence, but then also make sure that he doesn't get too comfortable and that you're pushing him forward. Hey, and one yeah. thing that I thought was interesting and it resonates a lot with me um, and I want to, after this, I want to talk about art of sport and really dive in there because there's yep. a lot of uh, amazing things you all are doing and really disrupting an industry that's been uh, somewhat stagnant for a long time. But one thing that I thought was really interesting with you is how agnostic you've been to industry. And that's unusual. And I think it almost flies contrary to kind of business school of get a, you know, get a lane, become an expert and yep. and but I think um, it's, I think there's pros and cons to both approach, but how did that kind of happen? And, and how have you, you know, moved from business services to now consumer and kind of talk us through that journey and, and what you think the pros are, uh, to that are and, and the cons? Yeah, um, I, it's an interesting, catch me on a certain day and I'll probably like fall into one or the other in terms of pro or con and, and, and sort of either rail at you and say it was a huge mistake. And then on the other end, I'll say, no, thank God I did that. But 
Um, so I don't know if there's a fixed answer here, but I, I will say that I, um, I've always been very curious, um, and I, and I, and I, I think less than the monetary pursuit of like doubling down and tripling down on, on a lane where I can extract, you know, certain amounts of money from it because I'm now an expert. I think I've, I've allowed myself to be uh, more explorative and, and, and just kind of meander through things that, um, I think maybe a testament to my youth or my childhood where I was able to play with a lot of different types of things. Um, you know, basically become comfortable enough that I have a toolbox that allows me to navigate through uncertainty. And so um, if something is new or foreign to me, whether that's, you know, the healthcare space or business services or an advertising agency or a physical goods product or a charity or whatever it might be, if there's something that I think captivates my attention and, and makes me excited about the premise of going in and, and manifesting something that's new and different and 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 you know value additive um, and scalable, um, then I'm almost it's almost irrelevant to me what it is. And and um, I say that in the same time I've also made the mistake of going too far um, and doing products that are conceptually very interesting on the surface, but then once you're in them after a couple of years, you're like, why am I doing this? This doesn't you know this isn't me. Um, and so I have to you have to sort of balance that curiosity with things with actual passions and interests that kind of go beyond just being surface level. Um, and, and, and I mean, I'll give you a more concrete answer to this that, that provided me the opportunity to experiment with this stuff because I wanna, uh, you know, I've had a lot of opportunity and privilege in my life, but sometimes I've put myself specifically in lanes where I can explore that and I still get paid at the end of the day and other people can, can do this too. Um, and, and one example of that is when I was, um, when I was in London, I, 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 I started and then later I joined a couple of digital agencies. And these digital agencies were very focused on not marketing, but on kind of building transformative businesses with their clients. And so that meant that they would conceive of new products and they would conceive of new services for these big brands who weren't able to do that innovation internally. And that always surprises people, I think, sometimes that they're like, oh, really, clients outsource this stuff? And nine times out of 10, they, they really do because they have way too much red tape and they've got way too much internal bureaucracy um, that you can actually sit down with the CEO of Nike or the CEO of some of these big companies and tell them what the future looks like. And they might appropriate some budget to you going after that and experimenting. And so that's the kind of agency I worked with and worked for. Um, and we did that for a range of clients. And one day it would be an insurance company that came in through the door and said, hey, we want to be a data business. We don't want to be in the business of, of, of selling people insurance. And so you would get to reimagine that for them. I, I once had a call from a, uh, from a bank in Istanbul that used to be a military bank. Now it was going private. They had 40 million customers and they had no online banking. And they said, what does online banking look like for us? What is that? You know, what is the future there? Because we'll invest in all the latest technology. And so you get to go from kind of canvassing what Chase looks like and Wells Fargo and Bank of America, looking at all of those, those interfaces, looking at all of that functionality and saying, okay, well, what if we did this, you know, 2.0 modern version um, and what, what, what do consumers want? And so you get to then revel in a year or two years of worth of research and, and designing things for these consumers. And inevitably what happens is these things don't live in isolation. They're not just, you know, it's not just online banking on a website, that has to then connect to the ATM. That then has to connect to the retail environment. That then has to connect to the CRM and the marketing efforts. Um, and before you know it, this one little project sort of becomes the pulse or the heartbeat of what this organization is gonna be. And you are then in a position to manifest that out through multiple layers. Um, and, 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 and you go on that journey with them. So you're essentially building companies with them at scale. Um, and there's no, Opportunity. There is an opportunity to fail. Obviously, if the project sucks and you don't deliver it, then then you're out, right? But but if you if you do deliver it and it's a multi year long project of transformation, you get to have a front row seat to that. You're still getting your salary. You know, you're in there. No, there's no skin off your back. Yeah, and the learning that you get. You know, I always think that's one thing I love about the agency business is it's like dog years in terms of the experience. Like I think. Oh yeah. The, you get seven years of experience in one year just because you're seeing so many different models, so many problems, so many different styles. 100%. And, uh, it is interesting what you say because I think that there's a lot of value to having somebody like yourself uh, in this category that you're in now 
that maybe hasn't come up through the big players because it's very easy to get uh, limiting beliefs and group, you know, kind of group think yeah. and bring in a fresh perspective and, you know, those barriers just aren't there. And so that's something that I've seen in our business too. I never worked at an agency or anything like that before Power Digital. And so we always did things in a way that we just thought made the most sense and was going to be yep. best for our people. Totally. And I think that uh, was a huge difference maker, especially early on for us to have the success that we've had. So 100%. And um, yeah, so I want to talk about your current, uh, one of your current babies, uh, I'm sure, Art of Sport. And uh, can you just tell me a little bit about how Art of Sport came to be and yeah. you know how, how you how the, how it was founded and, and talk through that. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, I moved to LA about four or five years ago. Now, uh, I was in London building a different company, um, and, and came to LA thinking, what is it that I want to spend, you know, the next decade of my life building? Um, and I was introduced to Brian Lee. Brian Lee was, uh, at the times, uh, I believe he was chairman of honest company. He had built honest company from a napkin to, I think a billion plus valuation, um, incredible, incredible trajectory. And he had a hit string of incredible businesses and was also an active, is an active investor. Um, so he's a real, I would say he's a pillar of the Los Angeles um, uh, uh, tech community. Uh, he's a major, major supporter of tons of entrepreneurs. And because he's been here so long, he's generations of entrepreneurs now have, have, have come through and worked with Brian or had some connection with Brian. And so it was uh, a real privilege for me to sort of as a as a young buck, if you will, you know, sit down with Brian, also still very young um, and many years ahead of him, but sort of both sit there in a room together and say, hey, I'm, you know, I'm stepping down from Honest Company. Um, I'm thinking about what I want to do next, like, and me saying, you know, I want to, I want to build another a player um, in, 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 you know, or pursue another opportunity. Um, and we both came to this, um, we, we had a couple of ideas we were sort of playing with, but the one that really stood out was, was, um, Brian had a, had a sort of a moment of, uh, sort of a light bulb moment when he was, um, he, he went to CVS and I think he saw a wall full of sunscreens that said sport on them. And he said, you know, it's, it struck me that's very weird that, that, that we have these old brands doing sport. And, and I immediately latched onto that because I had done uh, work previously with a ton of sports brands, like the Nikes of this world and understood implicitly what, it, what the difference was between somebody who was sort of using sport as a, as a marketing moniker versus some, a, a business that was true to sport and that worked with the athletes on the field to develop products for them, set an inspiring tone, set that kind of lighthouse aspirational message, but also make sure that it's accessible to the rest of the world. Um, and you know, Nike's Bill Bowerman's, you know, if you have a body, you're an athlete idea. Um, always resonated with me personally because of my love for sport. And so I, I loved what those brands represented in the world. Nike was always a, a brand I loved. Um, so I, I sort of instantly gravitated to, I think that world where it was like, well, where is the Nike of skincare? I don't understand how, if, you're, if your skin is your largest organ, you're applying these products to your skin multiple times a day for the rest of your life. Um, you know, is there, is there, is there a, a rationale or justification for a brand to exist that creates formulas and creates products that active people can trust to apply to their skin every day that gives them, you know, the better, better formulas omits chemicals from their formulas uh, and, and, and still is able to, you know, perform and provide that high performance uh, skincare solution. And so that's, that's where our brains gravitated quickly. We walked all the aisles of the store and we saw that the sport was being used in the deodorant section. It was being used in the shave categories and hair. Uh, it was being used in the analgesic pain cream space. It was being used in, um, in the, in the um, uh, obviously the sunscreen space, but, but it was surprising to see this. And then when we started to dig in, dig in a little bit, we noticed that some of the best selling products uh, said sport on them because I think you know, consumers go into the aisle and they think that there's going to be greater efficacy from a product that says sport. Um, when in fact, actually, we met somebody from one of the big conglomerates and he said, I was the guy who put sport on the label of this deodorant stick. We didn't change the formula, but you know, all, marketing. Was, yeah. all marketing, we saw it 3x, you know, we put a little football player on there and blew up. Um, 
so we thought we had a thesis and then and then from there it was a real journey into authenticity and it was a question around what is it we could accelerate that we could accelerate this in the way that we know how to accelerate startups but if we're going to be really you know a disruptor in the space we have to build this with athletes we have to get out there on the field we've got to interact with athletes throughout the life cycle of this company we've got to bring their voices into the organization from day one um, and we have to stay absolutely true to serving them and 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 so on so i think that was the initial basis of of the idea and then it turned into how do we how do we manifest this properly and then we said we have to bring on board partners and founders in this company with us who are athletes um, and and have lived the athletic journey their whole lives and for us you know there was a lot of discussion around what type of athletes to bring on board because it's not just a name and a face that we want to throw up on a billboard it was are these people prepared to build a business with us have these people you know, committed to the grind and, and are passionate about their sport and, and sort of live by their values? Um, and, and ideally, do these people have an appreciation for, for building sport brands and, and, and sort of understanding what sport culture is? And Kobe for us was the sort of zenith of that, the ultimate person there. Who I mean, else was there. on that short list uh, with Kobe for evaluation? Uh, there was no one else on the short list for the first Kobe, 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 and Kobe. Uh, it was just Kobe, Kobe, Kobe. And, and it was, I mean, it was for, for, a, for as a co-founder, we felt he, he transcended sport. I mean, he, you know, if you transcend sport to become a household name and a legend like that, that's, that's, that's very hard to find elsewhere in the world. And he was also in a place where he'd been building body armor, um, the beverage brand successfully. Uh, he obviously helped build Nike for 20 something years um, and, and understands exactly what it means to build, build those brands. So he was very much not just an athlete in that, in that shape and was really moving heavily into uh, taking all his learnings into business. And so he was incredibly, incredibly uh, uh, insightful uh, when we sat down with him and introduced him to the idea. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, through that pitch, because I can imagine I would be, <laughs> shaking, you know, talk about being starstruck slash lots of emotions. So I know you told me this story before, but as you roll up to that meeting, what's <laughs> in your mind and how does, how does that one go down? Talk us through that if you would. Yeah, I, I have a, a rule that I try to apply, um, which is to basically um, not think about the meeting uh, until I open my mouth for the pitch. Um, and of course I do the preparation and I prepare the presentations, but I, I definitely know of my own sort of my mental limitations that I psych myself out if I think about it. So I don't think about it. I go in there, I stay cool. Um, and then of course, like as soon as he walks in the door, it was just like a tidal wave of charisma and just star power. I mean, and the weirdest thing about this whole thing is, is about a year prior, I remember seeing one of his last games and I was sitting uh, at courtside and I saw him and he was, uh, he was right next to me. And for some weird reason, I don't know how, I'm, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a sort of a spiritual person, or a, a, but, I, but I remember thinking I, I recognize this person in a very personal way. I, I sort of, I feel like I know this person. I think a lot of people felt that about him. Um, but it sort of was almost a case of like, I, I, I feel like I'm gonna be doing things with this person. Um, so when I saw him, he felt very familiar to me. Um, and, uh, and I'd grown up with the guy and uh, he sort of was very casual when he walked in the room and he sat down, he's like, all right, take me through it. And, um, and we went from there and, and you know, I think uh, your muscle memory kicks in when you prepare your presentations and you, you, know, you know what you wanna hit on. And he was very uh, receptive. He was very critical. Uh, he was, but he was very respectful of, of, of just listening to the story first. Um, and he'd take, you know, he'd take shots at things that he in intuitively, instinct instinctively felt wasn't right. But fundamentally, he gave us the opportunity to, to, to tell him what it is that we were trying to accomplish. And, um, and his first response, I think, which is a good response was, you know, he sort of like mm, looked at us like this. And I was sort of, you know, I was worried, okay, it's going to go one of two ways here. Uh, and he, and he, when he frowned and, and looked at me, he was, it, the question that came out of his mouth was, was essentially, how does this not exist yet? Um, I don't understand. This seems, this seems very obvious, which is great. Um, but obviously being in the beverage space, going up against Gatorade with a new, with a new player doing better for you beverage, I think his head was already in a space of how is there no one in the, in the, in the, in the grooming space in the men's grooming space doing this well. And, and from there, it went very quickly into, I want to see the samples. I want to try this stuff. I want to smell this stuff. Who else is going to, who, what athletes are you talking to? You know, that athlete might not be right for us, but we should be considering this. 
Um, and he really, he put a flame underneath us to really challenge ourselves to, to bring a, a, a group, a stable of athletes around the business, not just him. When, when, once he signed on, that was incredible, but he really wanted us to make sure that we had a number of actors at the table. And so that's when we went out and started talking to a few, a few athletes that we felt could be our sort of round table. Um, and that's when we brought James. Quickly Harper. before that, how, how long was it from that first meeting with Kobe till uh, he signed on the dotted line and, and became a, a partner in the business? Uh, it was it was maybe a week. Wow. Yeah, it was fast. And I mean, look, we you know we we had the benefit of of course of of having built businesses before. Brian carries a lot of weight um, as well. And, you know, we, <clears throat> we had good capital partners, we knew how to execute, we had a very clear plan. And so it's sort of a case of saying, well, yes or no, really less of a case of, do I want to scrutinize the, the, the business fundamentals, you know? Um, so once he signed on, that was, it was phenom phenomenal. I, I almost couldn't believe it. And in fact, I had, I had a, you know, a, a story in the, in the back of my mind that I always come back to, which is I remember telling my girlfriend at the time, Hey, I think I'd love to go talk to Kobe about this idea. And her, her response to me okay. was, <laughs> yeah, her response is you're full of shit. You're not, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, and, and so I come back to that and just thinking, you know, I had that, then that moment of reckoning like, oh shit, he's a, he's a co-founder with me. Um, <clears throat> and then, then we started to go talk to some other folks. That was, that was also very exciting for me because we wanted to look at folks from diverse backgrounds, uh, different ethnicities, different ages, different sports, different moments in their career, different genders. Um, and we're very deliberate in who, who, who are the muses for us that represent these values. Um, yeah, we could just go after famous people, but who, play, who plays with an attitude? Who, who's faced adversity and come back from it? Who's, you know, who's an outlier in their sport? Who's got a crazy attitude that, that pairs amazingly with their performance on the field? Um, and, um, and so we brought on board James Harden, uh, incredible, incredible athlete. Now with Brooklyn Nets, I'm very excited to see that. A lot but, of uh, headlines uh, over the last couple of weeks. A lot of headlines, not no not press. all positive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but I mean, like his first game, you know, an incredible performance, and I mean, he's an he is an incredible athlete, and his attitude and his personality is 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 very unique, um, and and I think he transcends sport in a way that people love him for for his, who he is, exactly who he is. Um, and so we found that personality in Javier Baez from the Cubs um, as well. Uh, we found that in Juju Smith-Schuster from the Steelers, uh, who also has a million plus folks watching him live stream himself playing video games. So very versatile character, very interesting, multi multifaceted personality. Um, we found that personality in Sage Erickson, who's a, a surf champion. Um, and she has an incredible story. Ken Roxon from the motocross community is incredible. Uh, had an, an, a terrible injury that almost, he almost lost his arm and he came back from that and he's a champion and he's an incredible mindset. Um, I'm trying to think if we've forgotten anyone else, but um, I, you know, that, that, was the, that was the initial starting team. Oh, and Ryan Sheckler, of course, a skateboard legend. Um, and, and he had a, 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 a great friendship with Kobe and, and he, he's seen it all and he's, he's still competing at a very high level. And, and so that was the team we started with when we launched it. Um, and they had about 75 million followers across all of their social channels. Um, and you know, when you pulled a curtain off of something like that with you know, uh, these, these incredible talents um, and you're going after a big category in, in, you know, in a way that no one's seen before, it got a tremendous amount of press and, and great amount of traction. And um, you know, we really tried to make sure that we could play the game well in this, in this very difficult and saturated and, and noisy business landscape. And, and I think you have to, you know, there are lots of ways you can build a business, but this was one way where we knew we had to have a very sharp tip of the spear to enter, uh, enter the arena because of all of the legacy players in it already. Um, yeah, and obviously, and so, I think you believed in the product, but you need to just get that first purchase so that the product can do its magic. And, you mm -hmm. know, not only does it give you that cool factor, but uh, it gives you kind of some brand equity from them as you're, yes. as you're starting out and nobody knows you and you're brand new. And, and so that makes sense. And how did you negotiate these partnerships so that it was more than just kind of, you know, what you oftentimes see with a celebrity or an athlete that's just kind of the face or just endorses a product. What, what was unique about that and what did yeah. it 
to have around that? Um, well, I mean, first and foremost, it was really a vetting of the personalities. So, um, you know, I, I, I think a good example of that is, uh, you know, Kobe and James had worked in the past. They both had equity stakes and body armor. They both saw what that meant. They both knew that they had to work on that thing early when it, was, when it wasn't Nike, when it didn't have all of the perks and the luxuries that Nike could throw at them. And they saw their, that, that sweat equity pay off. Um, so those two were obviously very, very excited about the idea of, of building companies and both at stages in their lives where they'd seen that they'd seen the, the fruit of their labor pay off. Um, and then conversely, you know, uh, Ken Roxon and, and Ryan Sheckler, active angel investors already. They, they're already in a mindset where, you know, Ryan, I think he, he invested in Stance early on. He's invested in a couple of businesses. His dad actually worked at, at, at Stance early on and helped build the Stance business. And so that was part of his family's culture of, of how do I, you know, I'm a diverse uh, business person. I, I'm an incredible athlete. I use that platform where I can, but I, I want to get involved. I want to get my, my sleeves rolled up as an investor um, because that, that, that allows me to help build a business and, and see it grow and, and mature into something that's very valuable. Um, with Juju, it was really his first time um, thinking about these things, but his head, his head space was fascinating because He's, he thinks of himself as a media entity who happens to play football, which is super smart um, because he, he's managed to build, a, he's I think the second or third most recognizable football player in the league in his second year. And it's because he, you know, he's, he's gone big into creating content. He partners with TikTok influencers all day long. He puts out content about the wildest stuff. He has partnerships with MeUndies, with Domino's Pizza, uh, you know, I mean, he, he's, he's, he's all over, he's all over the world doing all these amazing things because he thinks of himself as a media entity. And, and as a result, he thinks of the businesses he should be involved with as, uh, as, as falling under that ecosystem and how can he lift those. Um, and so as a result, I think my point here is, is that they were all in that headspace. We were in a position where they came to the party very early on. We offered, you know, a combination of equity uh, opportunities to sit in business meetings with us, opportunities to affect the products, to feedback on design. They all had first front row seats to all the samples, all the iterations of those samples. Uh, we sent product to their teams so that their teams could try it. You know, there was, there's pride in that. Um, and, you know, we did some pretty crazy stuff early on. We put them on billboards in Times Square, or we, we came up with some pretty compelling and aggressive new marketing. Uh, that really leveraged their personalities. Juju Smith-Schuster starred in our first TV commercial. Um, uh, James Harden starred, starred in a full, and he carried the whole commercial. It wasn't just him saying a word, it was him and a personality being involved in this business. And as a business owner, as well as an actor, as well as an athlete, you know, there's so many things that converge for that, I think for, for that mentally. So, so, so it's been an amazing journey to involve athletes in a really authentic way. And I think as a result, the relationship naturally moves into um, doing things for the business that go above and beyond your sort of yeah, normal taking relationship. The ownership mentality and pride in it and, yeah. it's and they've been a part of that journey. And so, you know, they want to make great decisions and go above and beyond for the business where it's not just like, all right, I'm getting a paycheck, whatever, I'll, I'll do this and I'll check the boxes. And I think that's, it's very hard to do, I think. Um, yeah. I think some of it probably is the track record that, that you all had and the success that you're able to point to. Yeah. It's also, you know, uh, an amazing playbook that others should follow. And, and to give people context, what type of funding did the business have at this point? Because it was a startup. It's not like you guys, I know that you pride yourself on the scrappiness of your team in the best of ways, not like being resource deprived, but, you know, really yep. being scrappy and lean and fast. But what, what was the funding like and, you know, kind of the scale at this point when you were doing all this? Yeah, so we, we, um, we would not have gotten out of bed to do this without the right funding. Um, there's just no way to slow roll into competing with Axe and Old Spice. Um, you can't. Um, and, and not only that, but if you're going to be committed to innovation for the athlete, there has to be dedicated resource and skill that can actually pull off iterating these products and developing these products. Um, and it's not a case of, you know, us doing a small batch of oats or granola in our kitchen. You know, you're working with very high tech, high, high velocity, high, high order sizes to produce these products, especially when you're selling them at, at a price point like ours, which is at 695. 
you know, we're, we're trying to provide better for you products that are vastly superior in their formulation standards at a price point that is as accessible as some of these folks that have been in the game for 30, 40 years who have the logistical benefits of having built those platforms for years. And so as a result, you know, again, our North Star was to disrupt the space and give consumers this at the highest possible and the, and the best possible way with the most, you know, um, inspiring message with the, all the correct values with all these incredible athletes. Um, and you can't do that if you're going to, if you're going to bootstrap it, it's just not going to happen. So we knew very early on, we would bring in a capital partner. We brought in Lightspeed. Lightspeed is a very, uh, is a brilliant uh, fund out of Silicon Valley that we've done business with many times, longstanding relationships there, a lot of trust. And, uh, and so we funded the business. I won't say how much, but we brought in enough to carry us all the way through if we need it. Um, we knew that we were going to diversify into multiple channels. And as a result, we knew that each of those channels was going to require a certain dedicated amount of resource and funding to get us into those channels correctly. So our partnerships with Amazon, we headlined Prime Day in our first year with Amazon, uh, which, which shot us up to the, you know, some of the best selling products in, in the country uh, overnight. And you can't, you know, again, you need, you need to fund that correctly. Our relationship with Target went from zero to 100 in, in the span of, I mean, literally one day to the next, where now you've got 14 products on shelves at 1,600 locations. You know, this year, we're going to almost 10x uh, our retail footprint. Um, so, you know, that gives super you- super interesting because I feel like that's, you know, you're zigging while others are zagging. Not very many people are, if anything, we're seeing people that are, the e-com trend in D2C is so strong that they're trying to diversify there. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. What, what, what is your, what is the thought process behind that? I think that retail yeah. offers so much value, not only as a sales channel, but marketing and brand awareness. Yeah. But what yeah. is your guys's, uh, what's the risk of making that move? Uh, and kind of how did, how did you think through that decision in a time that most people are kind of doing the opposite? Yeah, there are a lot of risks. Um, you know, I think the, the uh, one thing I fall back on to just kind of like uh, relax my mind a little bit is, um, is that most consumer brands that we've seen in the world are the product of having been a brick and mortar. You know, it's just, we've, we've reared ourselves in the last 10 years to believe that really the only way you can build a successful brand in some way, shape or form is via this kind of dot com or online or direct to consumer channel, i.e. Warby Parker or, uh, you know, some of these other sort of D2C brands. The reality is, is that every day, billion dollar brands are born and grow successfully in retail. Um, and they will continue to do that. And, and I, I would say nine times out of 10, if you're looking at, you know, M&A activity in the consumer goods space, those are almost entirely brick and mortar businesses. So, you know, Vital Proteins recently or Liquid IV recently or um, Primal Kitchen or Sir Kensington's. I mean, I could go on and on and on. Those are all, all retail businesses. And, and that's not to say they can't, they can't have great traction online too. I mean, that's the holy grail if you could find both. But I think, I think the important thing here is to not underestimate what retail does and to your point, you know, it, it is absolutely a, a marketing channel. I mean, it's like having a billboard in a high traffic, high traffic location that you're, you're selling product prof for a profit uh, uh, inside versus D2C, which is you having to spend a tremendous amount of capital in all these social channels where everyone's vying for the same consumer, ultimately, early adopters, uh, you know, um, and folks generally within that 18 to 34 age range um, coming to your site, then buying it once, might never come back again. And so you're living in the averages, you're living in that blended uh, financial model where you're saying, okay, net, net, I hope it all nets out correctly. Uh, you might lose and money. The economics the can be so hard with a, you said 699 or whatever the price point is. It's like, uh, completely. you yeah. know, to get that, when you look at the cost of driving that traffic, if you don't just have a ton of brand awareness and yep. then the conversion rate that you can attain and then the average order value, that math doesn't pencil uh, a lot of times yep. at that type of price point too. And a lot of times you, it's a great point. Those things like I, Liquid IV is a good product that I, I'll buy, but it's very much opportunistic going through the, the store and being like, oh yeah, I'm going on this trip. I could use this. Yeah. So that's not yeah. 
Yeah. I'm not like seeking that out or shopping for it per se. Yeah. So it is interesting and, and it's a great point. And I also think a lot of the buyers that you're talking about, they still just understand retail better. Yeah. And I think it's more a more comfortable playing field. And so to your point, 100%. I think one of the beautiful things you guys are doing is you could be that tip of the spear for them in the years to come uh, if you wanted to, as they are trying to learn more the dot com side, but you have both elements and they, they they'll feel that they've got distribution they can offer and these yeah. different factors. So and, and also, I mean, remember, and, and we can get really deep into the weeds here on the balancing act between the pros and cons. And there are quite a lot of them that we haven't really even touched on yet. But like, um, you know, when you're when you're dealing with with the price points that we have and we're proud of them, um, you know, volume is an important factor in arriving at those margins. And, and, and volume is, is in one way you get that in an economical way is via retail. Um, and so as a result, you know, retail has to be part of your vision if your vision is to provide brilliant product at a price point that every person can afford. And so it, it becomes a central pillar of your in, entire outlook and vision. The other piece, of course, is that, you know, and uh, the, 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 um, and then one of the, the downsides, of course, is that, you know, volume presumes that you're going to have a lot of people knowing about you. So awareness. And so as a result, then, you know, what are the marketing channels and what are the costs associated with doing business? So that somebody walking down the aisle actually sees your product and decides to pull it off the shelf. And you can go way too fast, way too hard into retail and have way too much exposure at way too many doors with way too many products that the consumer just doesn't even know about and doesn't, isn't interested in buying because they're looking at the price and they're saying, hey, there's a three pack here of this old brand I know for the same price. Why would I touch this stuff? So, so, so much of it gets into the weeds of, well, how do you work with those retailers to really lift the message, surface the brand in store? Um, and sometimes you might have to really take the hard line of saying, okay, we're not going to do business with these people because they're not going to give us that trade marketing support. We're not going to get in a position where we can surface the brand and tell our story. Um, and unless we have that, we, we, we just can't, we can't go into business with you because it's too high of a risk. And so there's a constant balancing act. Now, every, every single retailer has its own economics, right? Every single retailer has its own negotiation. So also weighing up who's going to be highly profitable versus less profitable. You know, where are we going to make an investment in year one? Hopefully it pencils out in year two. What happens if they discontinue your business in year two or year three? How is that going to play out for the company? You know, all those questions are a tremendous amount of risk that you don't have to think about if you're all you're doing all day long is looking at your Facebook ads and looking at your, you know, your, your average order value and your lifetime value. If you, if you just focus on that all day long and it's working for you, great, you know, more, 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 more power to you. But that's, a, that's, a, that's not enough of a, if you're really going to be an omni-channel business, you have to become proficient in all those things to weigh up correctly the risks and, and do that buying and those forecasts correctly. Um, and, and, you know, the last thing I'll say is, is that, you know, Target as a first entry point into retail is an incredible partner. Uh, they, they have a, an affluent consumer who has been trained to go down the aisles and look for new things. That's part of the excitement and joy of going to Target is to discover some new brands. They have buyers who are the best in the world who are choosing. And again, don't forget, these buyers also have to find innovation. They also have to find products that, that you know, are hard to find elsewhere or that are brand new or that fill a lane inside their shelves. And they can only choose so many brands. It's, obviously, Amazon has three, four, five million SKUs. But, but these buyers, they have to sometimes work within lanes of three or four SKUs. Right. And they're dealing for consumers across the country. And so their question is, well, if I'm going to bring your brand in, how is this going to support a guy in Missouri versus in Arkansas versus in California? And our message was just as, as, as resonant and as big as you can sort of get in the grooming category. So they viewed that as this, this is something we're prepared to take a risk uh, over. And, and these guys are going to be bringing brilliant marketing opportunities and activation opportunities for the business to us. And when they're weighing up the risk of, hey, do we want to do business with these guys? They see all these check boxes that they don't normally get with a new retail brand. And so all of that factors into how you concoct and build out your rollout strategy, because it's a give and take. You, know, you're const you are really trading across not just, hey, I'm going to give you product and you're going to sell it for a profit. You're trying to lift everyone's businesses and give everyone a sort of a luster and a shine that they're bringing the best to the world. And if you can do that in partnership with the right partners and in, in the correct cadence with the right risk sort of understood and the right channels, then you've got something really compelling. Um, the challenge, of course, is we're moving at a million miles an hour. So we've gone from 
literally just being online only in 2019 to probably being in 11, 12,000 doors in 2021 in the next month. Um, and you have to be, you know, <laughs> you, again, coming back to your question around funding, you also have to make sure you've got enough capital in the bank to, to weather some of those, those, those weird uncertainties. Totally. Yeah. And it's interesting. We've helped a lot of, uh, we've done it both ways. So we've helped brands that were very traditional brick and mortar create that D to C engine. And the big value there, sometimes the revenue is a drop in the bucket, but the customer insights that they get from those customers really fuels every channel. But then we've also helped a lot of uh, D to C brands, you know, go to retail. And it's interesting because when you start D to C, it does give you some things. It gives you a lot of info on your customer and probably helps you better pick the right retail partners and yep. area of focus. And then it also gives you leverage because, you know, we've had clients where we've created these reports where they're able to go to a Whole Foods or uh, a Walmart or whoever and show them the amount of demand yep. that there is for that product in their areas. Yep. And, you know, that gives you a data driven, more advanced story. And to your point, these buyers, they need to make a compelling business case and you need to help them win at their job. Um, yeah. And so yeah. I think it's it's really interesting. And to, and to that point, just to add to that, you know, you've got, you know, Amazon provides uh, a, a sort of a more open and transparent forum where you're 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 not just bringing your D to C data to the to the buyer, where they just have to have faith that you're not bullshitting them. You know, they can see, okay, this thing has set ten thousand five star reviews. Um, you know, this is this is one of the best selling products on Amazon. That's not a that's not something they can sort of artificially inflate or inflect. Um, and so we're going to take that as as clear examples that we can then get behind at retail. And that's partially what the Amazon engine sort of provides is, is, is a sort of a degree of that social proof that can't be manipulated um, and, and sort of speaks for itself. Uh, it provides a number of other brilliant opportunities, i.e., you know, launching products on there to see if it works without sacrificing your brand. You know, you get early traction, you know, the cost of acquisition is a lot lower. You can kind of play with that. It's also as a, as a runoff channel, it's very, it's very, uh, it's very important. Um, and, and so, it, you know, I think in the context of the, the, the wider, bigger vision of how do you fulfill an idea or how do you, how do you, how do you, you know, pursue this, this, uh, this sort of rapid growth and scaling without sort of scuppering your business in the process, you know, all these channels provide advantages and, 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 to, and disadvantages, but advantages that need to be really sort of doubled down on for the company to sort of um, find its, find its footing and, and, and reach its potential. Totally. Yeah. You and I could probably talk through this subject for a whole day. Um, and it's super interesting. And I love, uh, love hearing your perspective on it and, and uh, viewpoint. Uh, a couple kind of closing questions for you yeah. that I think are going to be interesting. What uh, For Art of Sport, what's like the most creative or kind of risky marketing program that you've deployed that has not worked? Um, let's see. It's hard to it's hard to pinpoint exactly. I think coronavirus has really thrown off a lot of things for us. Um, to the extent that you know we we had an, a very active grassroots program, um, and we connected with about a million athletes on the field out across the country. Um, high school and we, athletes, uh, that type of thing. All of that, all high school athletes, everyone from you know uh, uh, football combines to volleyball camps to and we get to play authentically in that space. It's very hard for any other kind of skincare brand to rock up and really talk about that stuff and, and kind of be relevant. Uh, but we, we have that advantage. So with grassroots out, you know, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of other things. We're pivoting a lot to, to other arenas. Um, you know, I, I, I can't specifically point to big flops in the marketing uh, efforts yet, uh, fortunately. Um, but, you know, we, we, we are experimenting with a lot of new channels. So we've, we've, we've run really, I think, compelling out of home um, um, campaigns. We get to use the athletes that are from those towns. So, you know, putting up James and Houston in school, we, we get to play with all of that regionality and that, and that, and that specificity in those, in, those, in those areas. That's what another sort of opportunity that sport offers. Podcasts is, is a challenging one. I think podcasts is, 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 you know, you can find some really brilliant arbitrage opportunities where you can get some great awareness and great kind of sponsorship headlines for a cost that's fairly low and those things live forever. So that's, that's pretty cool, but it's, it's, you know, podcast for us, I think is, is a, is a tool in a, in a wider toolbox uh, where, you know, we're not, we're not sort of going really hard at that because we just, we don't really see that pencil out for us in a way. That's, that's harder pretty, to measure too. You can get harder to measure. There's challenges. Um, 
but yeah, and we're and we're doing and and I think some of the biggest and most exciting things that we're doing is is bringing on on some of those wider marketing um, uh, campaigns, i.e., you know, doing TV for the first time. We ran TV commercials starring James Harden during the Last Dance, which was really popular. Uh, we were very fortunate in getting some ad space there. Um, and at a time when no live sports was happening, everyone needed some act to scratch that itch. And there's James Harden starring in an ad alongside the Michael Jordan documentary. It was, it was brilliant. Um, but we also were, we activated very successfully, I think, uh, a lot of end cap uh, uh, marketing uh, at, at retailers where, you know, you have life size pictures of James. We built out lockers, uh, uh, sort of hitting on that sort of sport lifestyle. Um, and we're going to be doing a lot more of that over the coming year with with a bunch of retailers. So I'm very excited to see it come to life. Um, we're still too early, I think, in our life cycle to really have said, you know, let's bet the farm on something and see if it works out. Like we we know of people who've done Super Bowl ads and that sort of thing to see if it works. We we haven't we haven't touched that. We've played more of a little bit more of a ground game. Um, and so uh, so yeah, I think I think this year is going to be incredibly uh, uh, insightful for us to see to see how our efforts actually pencil out. But uh, hopefully, hopefully, knock on wood, it'll it'll keep trending in the right direction. Yeah, so far so good. You guys are a rocket ship, and it's uh, it's fun to get to hear more about it. And I'm excited to follow the journey. I have two uh, two more questions for you. And yep. the one I know it's it's near and dear to a lot of our hearts, but obviously losing Kobe, I mean, it's amazing how impactful of a guy he was to see the way that people that don't even know him have mourned him and missed him and uh yeah. it really he really leaves that legacy but how did that impact your guys's company and uh how did you guys i'm sure that, that was incredibly difficult and still is but how did you guys kind of process and and mourn and work through that yeah i i think uh you know i think with kobe it's it's it was very very challenging um you know i don't think in my entrepreneurial career have i ever thought about you know a co-founder passing a passing, uh, certainly not in, in, in any way, shape or form, but not uh, in, in the way that he did. It was, it was extremely tragic. Um, I think the the approach that we always took with Kobe was and, and you know, we didn't have we didn't have all the opportunities in the world to sit down with him. Uh, he wasn't always available. He's a very busy person. He had all these interests and passions and, and commitments. So so we would take everything he said with with a real uh, reverence and and kind of codify that and put that in uh, sort of enshrine that in our company's values and uh, a lot of those were focused on building building brands that are authentic uh, being timeless uh, not trying to sort of have knee jerk responses to other things that competitors are doing you know, loving the process com and committing to the process and the grind of building a company uh, there were a lot of sport analogies that ring true. And, and you know, I, again, coming back to me feeling like I'm an athlete, I, I feel that in, the, in a professional sense too. It's you take a lot of knocks and you try and get back up and you try and keep going and you're building a team. And, and so a lot of those things are timeless messages that will resonate with the, with the venture and with us forever. Uh, I think that what, one thing that we saw happen is, is that his legend really blew, blew up even more, and I think people mourning his loss and realizing what they what 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 they had the privilege of having in their lives suddenly stripped away from them. Uh, I think that that sort of uh, exponentially increased the the legend of Kobe, and um, so we don't shy away from that being part of our founding story. We have him we have him as a founding partner and a co-founder in the venture, and that will be the case forever. And and we're working closely with Vanessa and and her family to to uh, you know do the do do uh, to, to continue to surface Kobe as, as part of a, a part of our story, be true to his legend and his and his legacy and his and his values. And and Vanessa has a lot of uh, areas of passion and her daughters are active in sport as well. And that's that's an area that we're getting behind more and more. And I'm excited about seeing that come to life. There are a number of initiatives there that we're that we're that we're thinking through and, and working on. And it's a process, you know, every day is there, there, there are uh, mostly bad days, then there are good days. Um, but I think I think we've taken a tremendous amount of inspiration from having him involved in the company. And and, uh, you know, I think you you as a brand, you, you build your brand to be relevant to a lot of people. And ideally, the brand outlasts its founders. Um, I hope my brand I hope this business outlasts me and, and goes on to be a, an incredible and iconic brand uh, globally. Um, and so to that end, I, 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 I take kind of consolation and inspiration from the idea of building something that will stand the test of time, irrespective of, of maybe the people that sort of originated it. 
Yeah, that's awesome and super inspiring and well said. And I guess that's my final question is if you had a magic wand and it's 10 years from now and everything went perfect and obviously these things change, but what uh, what does the brand look like and what is your role in the brand look like and what are you doing with your you know time? Uh, talk us through kind of what that daydream and vision looks like. Yeah, so I, I take a lot of inspiration personally from being in the weeds. I've I've been a builder and maker of companies for a long time, and so I that's where I I I'm I'm most passionate about. So I think my role in the organization is going to continue to be very hands on. Uh, it's always going to be very close to product development and ideation, packaging design, brand branding and marketing, uh, you know, partnerships and growth, um, and 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 sort of you know maybe maybe part of me is has done myself a disservice, but going back to some of your earlier questions about curiosity and putting yourself in new, new places and so on, you know, the pursuit of money hasn't, hasn't been my primary motivation. Um, and I hope that that will mean that I can continue to be actively involved in building an organization that puts the right things forward as priorities, rather than focusing primarily on just, you know, the back end and the finance and, and, and the money part of it. I hope those things come together. And I, I like to believe that you know, there is some version of meritocracy in the world where good stuff gets rewarded. And that's that's something I'll, I'll cling on to. Um, my vision for the business in the long term is, is that this is the de facto brand for this next generation, that it is, it is what, you know, the old spices were. It is what the axes of this world were, or the doves, uh, is an international brand that is recognized around the world. Uh, and that brings a tremendous amount of inspiration and innovation to a category that has been neglected for, I think, the better part of the last decade or so, where people haven't really asked themselves, what is the stuff I'm putting on my skin? So being able to elevate that category to a place where you might be uh, you know, applying a new lens to it and consumers are starting to think about these things in a new way as well, I think that would be the ultimate reward uh, for, me, for me personally. Um, and I think that's what I've always looked for when I'm in, in my path in entrepreneurship is, is there a way for me to move the needle um, in a way that does, does have some inherent legacy or, or some value to, to the world beyond just a business opportunity? And that's sort of my, that's sort of, I think, my, my dream for the business. Yeah, I love that. And I love this concept of being a net contributor to our society and our community. And certainly that's a big part of what you guys are doing. But such an awesome story. I mean, again, we could go on for uh, hours. I've got so many questions I'd love to dive into with you, but uh, I know that we're up on time, but I uh, really appreciate you joining me on Flip the Switch. And it's been uh, awesome chatting with you. And we uh, can't wait to follow the rest of your guys' journey in the years ahead. Likewise. And thanks. Thanks for the opportunity and, and the opportunity to talk about what we've been building. You know, you're in your, you're in your echo chamber doing this stuff in the mines all day long. And Sometimes it's nice to, to get a second opinion on, on what we're up to. So, uh, so thanks for that. Yeah, for sure.